Welcome to the evening services of the Manchester Church of Christ. We welcome each and every one of you, both present here this evening and those watching on YouTube. The first hymn this evening will be hymn number 968, Oh, They Tell Me of a Home, 968. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the Good evening. Let's uh, go to God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to be together, to study your word, to sing you songs of praise, and to just remember and refresh ourselves through the lessons that are presented to us. Father, we're thankful for the rain that you provided for us too, and uh, we've needed it, and uh, we hope other parts of the country will get some too. We also pray, too, Father, for the rest of the church as they are probably uh, online or uh, elsewhere. We pray that you'll just continue to bless them. We're thankful for Jesus, for his life, his sacrifice, his example for us. We hope, Father, that we'll try to walk as he did, pick up our cross, share the good news with those around us. We're thankful, Father, for the beautiful sceneries that you've given us at this time of the year. It's always so refreshing to uh, see the beauty of your creation. We ask you that you be with our speaker tonight. Guide him in the lesson he's going to provide for us. And thank you for your spirit, the opportunity to be here. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, 
a hymn of encouragement and invitation after the devotional will be hymn number 905. Before the devotional, let us sing 851, number 851. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll been a lot of talk about uh, the last days or the day of the Lord. So I thought I'd speak for a few minutes, share some thoughts with you. Uh, before I became a member of the church, uh, I wasn't what you would call an evangelical. No, I was raised Catholic, but I had issues with the Catholic Church. So I started reading the Bible, and I started reading Christian authors, well, so-called Christian authors. And there was a book by a guy by the name of Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth. And uh, I know now that it was rife with errors, but it presents a, a fairly compelling case for the end times. And uh, there have been other authors who have written about the end times. And, and the fact is that we don't know when it's going to happen. But we do know it's going to happen. So I'd like to uh, look at a few passages. One is from the prophet Joel. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. And Joel writes under inspiration of God, it says, It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, 
your young men will see visions, even on the male and female servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky, on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. So it's some pretty scary imagery uh, being spoken about uh, by Joel. But you'll recall in our study of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter and the apostles had been imbued with the Holy Spirit, and they came out and they started speaking in everybody's native tongue. And some people said, well, these people are drunk. They're babbling. They're speaking all kinds of gibberish. But Peter said, no, it's, it's, it's just the, the third hour of the day. We're not drunk. These men are not drunk. Men do not get drunk at this time of the day. Uh, and he said that this was a fulfilling of the prophecy that Joel spoke of. But you recall Joel also spoke about God was going to pour his spirit upon all mankind, Hebrew and Gentile alike. And uh, as part of his sermon, when they asked him, when they asked Peter, what must we do to be saved? He said, "Be," he said, repent and be baptized, all of you, for the remissions of your sin, and you will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. So at our baptism, the Holy Spirit indwells us as, as a gift, as, as a hope. Now I'd like you to turn over to the second epistle, second letter to Timothy. In chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good treacherous, reckless, conceited lo lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Sound like any particular period in history? Like maybe the 21st century? Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, Timothy, so Paul, writing to Timothy, writes, presents a pretty stark picture. Um, and if you look around in the world today, this description fits. Sadly, it fits. And he, he says further, beginning in verse 12 of that same chapter, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might be, possibly will be. You will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So that is Paul's charge to Timothy and to us that we ought to continue in the things that we have learned and what we have become convinced of knowing from whom we've learned them. And that whom is, is God through the men who, through the love of God, shared it with us. Now let's flip over to the second letter to Peter. The 
Second Peter verse uh, chapter three. Beginning at verse 1, this is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when, the, for when they maintained this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at the, that time was destroyed being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth in its works will be burnt up. So Peter is, again, uh, painting a rather stark picture, but he's reminding us that during the days of Noah, the flood, everybody was going around like they usually do. People were getting married, people uh, were dying, people were raising families and so forth, then the flood came. Similarly, all of us today, we're running around, we're living our lives, we're raising our children, spoiling our grandchildren, uh, you know, working going to school, and, and basically living our lives. And, and like in the days of Noah, there is going to come a day where God's going to call a halt to everything. So, so what? And here's the so what, continuing in verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven, a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own stead, uh, uh, steadfastness but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, now and to the day of eternity. So as Jesus taught when he was walking among us, the parable of, of the virgins and the lamp, some didn't have oil, some brought enough oil to wait until the groom came. We too ought to be prepared we too ought to continue to learn the
those things that God has taught us through his word. We ought to be waiting and watching and knowing that at any moment our master can return. So one of two things is going to happen. Either our lives is going to end naturally and then we're with God or he's going to return and everything is going to end in intense heat and we will be with God. Either way, those of us who have been baptized, we win. But those who uh, the writers describe as living other than holy lives, those who have, who mock, those who say, well, when is, when is he coming back? He says he's been coming back. When is it going to happen? Things have gone on the same year after year. Where is he? Well, Peter is saying, God's not, uh, he's not slow as we understand the term, but he is patient that no one would, uh, would, would uh, be destroyed. So I went a little long tonight, but, um, and I apologize for that. But the point is, is that the reason why we're here is, and the reason why we go out into our lives is so that we can share this news with other people. Not in, in the sense that, you know, you either turn or you burn. Hellfire and brimstone. Actually, it should be that we serve a God who loves us so much that he sent his son to pay the penalty of death, our just penalty of death for the sins that we've committed, he not having committed any sin. And so... Uh, we've, uh, by accepting his salvation, we are assured that we will not be destroyed. We will spend eternity with him in heaven where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no sin, because we'll have a new heaven, a new type of body. There is no unrighteousness. So if you're a Christian and you've not been living as you should, if you need prayers, uh, Please let us know. Be happy to pray with you, to sit down and talk with you, to encourage you, share scripture with you. If you're not a Christian and you want to become one, if you want to get in on this salvation, again, contact us. We'd be happy to study with you and, uh, and teach you as we have been taught. So uh, now we'll sing a song to uh, encourage you. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some mother to win. By manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Darlene is requesting our prayers. Uh, simply put, she's saying she's, she's struggling leading the Christian life. And I would hazard a guess that you're not the only one who has the struggles. But you uh, had the courage to come forward, ask for prayers, and uh, I, I commend you for that. And so let's, let's bow and let's, let's honor her request. Father, we come before you this evening, and Lord, we know that living the Christian life is not easy. It's a simple concept, just to obey what you have taught us. 
but it's in the execution where we fall flat. Uh, we're subject to temptation. We're subject to uh, all manner of, of flaws. And uh, sometimes we're weak and we do those things we ought not to be doing. But Lord, we are confident that your mercy never ceases. Your steadfast love never ceases. And that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful to forgive them, and that the blood of your Son, Jesus, washes us from all unrighteousness. That is what you have said in your word, and you are incapable of saying something that's not true. And so, Lord, we, we believe you, we trust you, and uh, please accept our confession. Please bless us, strengthen us so that we can do those things that we ought to, that, that we love as Jesus loved, that we walk as, as he walked, that we learn of him and that we conduct ourselves as a light and that uh, we, we do not fail, we do not fall. And uh, again, Lord, we uh, pray for your strength. We pray for our sister Darlene. And we pray for all who are struggling in one manner or another. And uh, we ask this and we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. I guess I'm doing announcements too. If you've been paying attention to the weather, uh, the Gulf Coast has been hit again with Hurricane Zeta. Zeta. It land, made landfall about 4 o'clock this afternoon at a ca strength of Category 2. And this is the fourth, fourth hurricane, fifth hurricane to strike the Gulf Coast this year. Uh, I guess God doesn't like Texas and Louisiana for some reason. I'm only kidding. Uh, it's just the uh, vicissitudes of, of weather currents and such. But, uh, you know, I, w I would ask that you'd continue to keep uh, the people along the coast in your prayers and that uh, they would be protected from any further storms so that they can recover, they can rebuild, and return to some semblance of normalcy. Uh, as far as announcements, the, there are people, the people that were asking for prayers on Sunday, well, they still need prayers. Um, I spoke with Kathy today, and she's doing a little bit better, and she's getting around a little bit better. Um, so people are being healed, people are improving, God is answering our prayers. And uh, that's all I have. Will? At 8.30. Okay, Will was saying that if uh, Saturday we have a scheduled work day, however, if the weather turns ugly, rain or snow, then it's going to be postponed to another day. They were talking snow for Friday. Yeah. Too soon. Yeah. My oldest son had heart surgery a couple days ago. And uh, he apparently had an extra elect electrode in his heart. And so they eliminated it. He was having all kinds of repercussions over this thing. Okay. But he's not feeling well. So if you could just pray for him. Yeah. Uh, Will and Kathy's oldest son? Yeah. Uh, had, uh, is having heart issues. Yeah. So if you could, uh, he had heart surgery, you said. Yeah, right? he already had it. 
and is recovering and but not going as well. Right. One of the electrodes has given him some bother. Yeah. Uh, so and also Linda Paul is asking for some prayers. She got some uh, result of some blood work that gives her concern. So she asks that you would uh, continue to hold her up in prayer as she could heal. Not seeing any further hands, that is all. Do you have a song for us? Listening to the news, there have been five hurricanes and the people in the Gulf area have been directed to evacuate their homes seven times this hurricane season, seven times. Hard times. Number 957, first verse. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. One of the advantages of my former career is that I got a supply of these portfolio things. Uh, my blue one, I got it at uh, in Florida during a business trip. And this one I got from New England College when I uh, taught, or I chaperoned a uh, field trip for the criminal justice. So if you see red, it's class. If you see blue, a sermon's coming your way. <sighs> no. We're in, we are still in Acts chapter 7. Somewhere of the vicinity of Uh, 35, 37, somewhere around there. So, we shall press on, as they say. And before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, again we come before you this evening thanking you for this time to take a few minutes and continue on through our journey through the book of Acts. Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the many lessons and examples that we find uh, contained therein. Uh, we are grateful for Scripture being honest and not just s telling us about the good things that your people have done, but it also demonstrates that, like us, they have flaws, that they have failed uh, 
in some cases failed miserably. But yet there was redemption for them. And Father, you are a God who seeks to forgive. You are a God who seeks to redeem, who seeks to uplift. And we are so grateful for your mercy and for your love. Lord, uh, as mentioned already this evening, we pray for our fellow citizens in the Gulf Coast, Louisiana and Texas, who uh, are dealing with their fifth hurricane to make landfall in that area. So, Lord, we pray for your protection over them. We pray that you would give them a season of peace and of decent weather so that they can recover, rebuild, and resume some semblance of a normal life. That you would uh, protect the people from harm, from loss of life, to keep them safe, be with the first responders, police, the fire, uh, for FEMA, and also for your people who have a disaster response ministry. There's a, a number of churches, uh, Father, that have taken on that ministry who send trucks of supplies and building materials to help, to help people to recover from these disasters. We pray for them as they respond. We pray for them as they labor to remove fallen trees and rebuild on behalf of the people who have been affected. We pray for their protection, we pray for their safety, we pray for their effectiveness in showing your love to the people who have suffered such devastation over the past few months. We thank you in advance and uh, we offer this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're still in the, uh, Stephen is still giving the council a Reader's Digest version of history, of their history. And it occurs to me that that might be somewhat presumptuous on uh, Stephen's part, telling men who are religious leaders, Pharisees who are schooled in the word, who know the scriptures, who know the prophets, who know the Psalms, and who I presume also know the history, Moses and Jacob and Isaac, and uh, how that unfolded. But and I think it's telling that, again, two points that keep coming up over and over again is the point that God is not limited by geography or by buildings, and that... Uh, that the Hebrews have a history of rejecting God's authority, that they have a history of rejecting those whom God has sent to lead them. Uh, most, uh, most recently is, is Moses. We were talking last week, uh, verse 35, where Stephen is saying, this Moses whom they disowned, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. So Stephen makes very clear that Moses was not acting on his own behalf, but he was appointed by God. And in verse 36, that this man led them out performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And then this Moses who said to the sons of Israel that God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. And it's my humble opinion that that prophet whom Moses was talking about was born in a stable in Bethlehem and grew up in the town of Nazareth. I sometimes uh, refer to him as the Nazarene carpenter 
who did rise up from among the Hebrews to become uh, their Savior, their Messiah. And he now sits at the right hand of God. Verse 38, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him but repudiated him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Can you imagine how annoyed God must have been with these people? because you have the 10 plagues that affected Egypt that forced Pharaoh to allow the people to leave. There was the miracle of the Red Sea dividing so that they can walk across it on dry ground as Pharaoh's army was getting ever, ever closer. And then there was, as they're in the wilderness, they're feeding them with manna and quail and water until they came to Mount Sinai. And Moses is up talking to God. And I imagine they saw some clouds and maybe heard some thunder. The point is, is that they knew this God who Moses was serving. They saw the power of this God who Moses is serving. So how, I don't really understand how they came to the point of, of crafting out of materials that originate from the earth, making a gold calf and saying, this is the God that did all that, that, that dealt with Egypt, that uh, s s divided the Red Sea, that took care of us in the wilderness. Uh, so I'd s it, it just it just boggles the mind. But again, I'm not saying that if I was there at the base of Mount Sinai that I would not, I, I don't think I'm so arrogant that I would think that I would probably not s submit to the pressure of the people and join them in, well, okay, if that's our God, that's our God, okay. I'm not sure uh, there, there were a lot of people like it today, and, I, and I think Exodus gives us a rough number it doesn't even take us 40 days to turn our backs on God you know it, <laughs> it can take you a week a day you know it just is, sometimes you don't even need pressure from other people just pressure on yourself I'll, I'll, I'll research that and I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, but it, it was a, couple, a few hundred thousand. I'm, I'm thinking four or five hundred thousand. He was. And that was men. Right. Not women and children. And cattle and sheep <laughs> yeah. and other livestock. And yeah. Plus all the stuff that the, the so Egyptians gave them. You know, all, all the gold that gold and other precious materials that the Egyptians gave them, because indeed these are the materials that they used for us to build this stupid calf. But they also used this materials to build the temple. I got this from a friend that's watching that said somewhere around 603,550. A lot of people. And a half. <laughs> 600 and 600 to what? 
they're working online. They sent me a text, 603,550. 603,550. That's, that's, well, that's five times the population of Manchester. Manchester is about 100,000, give or take. Yeah. He said to look at Numbers 232. Numbers 2, chapter 2, verse 32. He said it's five times uh, the population of Manchester? Yes. Um, That's a lot of people. Manchester, the population of Manchester hovers around 100,000. Maybe it's 89,000, maybe a little bit over. But that's, that's, as I recall it, that's about what the population is. That's, that's an impressive amount of people. And uh, feeding them. People got to eat. Uh, people got to drink. You know. And, and you know, I, I, I won't, <laughs> I, I will not uh, get into the more uh, I'll move on. But uh, again, Moses talks about how God is going to raise up a prophet. And some of the ways that Jesus meets this description, well, he was born Hebrew. He's certainly a prophet. Uh, he was appointed by God. You'll recall that at his baptism, the voice of God came out of the sky and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then at another, I think at the transfiguration, again, the voice of God, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him. So uh, also by all the miracles that Jesus did, it showed that he was approved of God. Plus the 300 plus prophecies about the Messiah that were fulfilled by Jesus. So his credentials were solid. And uh, I think it's, it's uh, you could make the case that Jesus is this prophet whom Moses spoke about. So after making this calf, they sacrifice to it, rejoicing in the works of their hands. Verse 41. And uh, there's a reference to uh, Amos which is Old Testament, Minor Prophets. And I believe it's right after the book of Joel. Yeah, Amos chapter 5 and verse 25. And God is speaking to the Hebrews, to Amos. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? You also carried along Sikoth, your king, and Kayo in your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the Lord of hosts. So getting back to Acts chapter 7. We find something similar written. I've discovered that bookmarks don't work at all if you don't put them where you want to mark your book. 
you can stick them on your notes till kingdom come and not helpful. So, in verse 42, but God turned away and delivered them to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacles of Moloch and the star of the god Ramphe, the images which you made to worship. I, will, I also will remove you beyond Babylon, which is beyond Damascus. Uh, so what God is saying says, yeah, you, you, you did sacrifices, but you weren't sacrificing to me. And uh, it, it makes a point. God has prescribed specifically how he wants to be worshipped. He did it in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law. He does it in this new covenant, this New Testament, under our current uh, uh, a current testament. And that is the essence of what we in the church seek to do, is to, to worship God in a manner that he has determined to follow his pattern, to follow the pattern that the first century church did. Doing anything other than what, had, what God has prescribed for us is not acceptable to God. Um, you can look at all the, the Christian religions. There are some that teach that baptism is not essential for salvation. They say, uh, they'll say, well, yeah, baptism is essential, but you, you know, you don't. All you have to do is accept uh, the Lord's gift of salvation to say that you believe in Jesus, you believe that when he died on the cross, he died for me. And if you get baptized after that, it's not because it's essential, it's because it's an outward witness of an inward grace. That, that's the adage they use, it's an outward witness to an inward grace. And, uh, and, and you can look among Christendom, they have all altered what the church was doing in the first century in some manner or form. I mean, the Reformation was a step to get back somewhat to, the, to what the church was. And then in the uh, early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, there were men from around the country, preachers, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Amish, uh, Mennonite, who in various parts of the country somehow came to the same conclusion. You know, why don't we do away with these man-made catechisms? Why don't we do away with these man-made rules? And let's just get back to Scripture. Let's just get back to what God wrote in his holy word. Let's give God's word the authority which it deserves. And... Uh, that is essentially what the restoration call is, and that is what we try to perpetuate to this day, is to take the scripture as God has written it and to obey it and, and do what God wants us to do, how he wants us to do it. Any comments, any questions? that they were worshiping that they're talking about they must have got from Egypt right either Egypt or eventually uh, the gods of Canaan uh, some of the Canaanite tribes I think I know that Moloch was a, a god of the Amorites I believe so and, and Moloch was the god that they used to sacrifice their children to right And it's, you know, it's,
I, I again, I, I don't uh, understand how people who have been directly affected by God can reject Him so so easily. You know, one of the one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is John chapter seventeen, where he's praying for his disciples. But there's a portion where he says, uh, not just for those today, but those who believe because of what they say through their witness. You know, and, and we've we never saw a miracle of God performed. We've never we didn't witness Jesus rising from the dead. We didn't see his crucifixion. We didn't see the nails in his hands and feet, the spear in his side. We take this because it was written down for us by men inspired by God. And we believe it because, frankly, there is a compelling case to believe that what the Bible tells us is true. Uh, you're looking at 66 books written by 40 plus authors over a period of over 1,500 years telling one coherent story from Genesis to the book of Revelations. Um, and God has certified these as being of his because of the miracles that he performed. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I have... I have difficulty understanding. I, I'd like to think that if, if I witnessed the miracles that occurred in Egypt and at the Red Sea and during our trek through the desert, I would at least offer the question when you say that when they came up with this golden cat, well, wait a minute. How do you explain all that that happened over the past few months? How do you explain... The blood turning, the, the water turning to blood, the frogs, the fleas, the gnats, the boils. How do you explain the Passover that only the firstborn of all Egypt died and only those who were not covered by the blood over the lintels? How do you explain that? You know, how, this golden calf that you built out of materials that we found here and that we took with us from Egypt? This calf is that God? It, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't. Uh, so, but it's written and that's, that's, that's what they did. And then in verse 44, our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. <coughs> Again, God is very precise about what he wants done. And Moses was very precise in following that pattern. And God gave a very specific design for what the, the temple, what the uh, the temple was supposed to look like. And Moses followed that pattern. Okay, we're going to stop here because it's eight o'clock, and we will pick it up on verse forty-five. So that gives us 15 verses to get through next Wednesday to get through this chapter. Last call for questions, comments? Um, Darlene? Even ge generations after them, for generations, the, the Hebrews just kept forgetting it about, about the miracles. But I, I, I too think of that a lot. I don't know how you forget uh, the parting of the Red Sea. I don't know anybody that can do that. Mm. You know? 
Yeah, I, I think it has something to do with the being human. And like Paul says in Romans 7, there's, there's the carnal side, there's the spiritual side that's currently constantly at loggerheads. And uh, sometimes we give in to the carnal side, sometimes we have the strength to do fulfill the spiritual side. So I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we're any different than they were. Uh, and, I, and I don't mean to imply that we're that much better. But it, it just intrigues me that so close, temp, I mean temporarily, by time-wise, they were so close to witnessing personally all this stuff after 400 years in bondage. So God's blessings upon you the rest of the week. Uh, drive carefully, stay warm, and we'll see you Sunday, Lord willing.